Keep your Bibles open to Luke chapter 6. The title for the sermon this morning is a question. A question. Are you living like a child of God? Are you living like a child of God? Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36 will be our text this morning and also the next time that I preach. We're only going to get through verse 31 today. Before we begin to work through this passage, I want to draw your attention to the end of verse 35 and the first part of verse 36. After giving all of what we could call the moral instruction found in the earlier verses of this text, Jesus says there at the end of verse 35, if you do these things, these instructions he has given earlier, there at the end of verse 35 he says, you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. And then verse 36, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. These verses don't just teach morals. Jesus was not simply giving the golden rule and then applying it to different circumstances in life. In this passage, Jesus taught that this is how we must act toward those around us, because this is the nature of God. God is kind and long-suffering to the unthankful and to the evil. God is merciful. God is loving. Are we emulating the kindness demonstrated by our Heavenly Father? Are we showing mercy? Are we living like the children of God? God wants us to live like we are His children. Before we begin, let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word for the instruction that's found in this text for us. Lord, I pray that as we look at this passage together this morning, that you would guide and instruct, convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, and help each one of us to go out from here with a greater desire to live as your children. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we get to our text itself, let's review the context of this sermon as a whole. And for this portion of Jesus' sermon in particular, Jesus, remember, he's in the countryside of Galilee, probably somewhere near the city of Capernaum. He was speaking to a mixed multitude of believers and unbelievers that were in three di distinct groups. There was first that general multitude, which was made up of people from throughout Judea and Jerusalem, the coast of Tyre and Sidon, as we were told earlier in this passage. There was a smaller group of committed followers of Jesus that's referred to as his disciples. And at the time, that was a fairly large group. And finally, there was the twelve who had just been chosen and called by Jesus as apostles. And we noted in the last sermon that there were unbelievers in each of these three groups. The multitudes would ultimately turn on Jesus and demand his crucifixion. Many of the disciples would turn away when the teachings of Jesus became hard to accept. And even among the twelve, one was a traitor. This is important because it means that not everyone who originally heard the words of our text from Jesus were children of God. Many of these people were not living like a child of God because they were not a child of God. They'd never truly been born again. There had never been a work of spirit of the Spirit of God in their hearts, bringing them from death to life. And so, in that sense, this text is a call to self-examination. Am I a child of God? Have I been born again? Now, please listen carefully to what I'm about to say, because I don't want there to be any undue confusion. But to a certain extent, you can follow the moral principles that Jesus gives in this passage and not be a Christian. Just because you do these things or you appear to do these things, it's no guarantee that you're a Christian. Many people with a very high degree of outward morality will hear Jesus say to them on the day of judgment, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So doing these things by themselves is no guarantee that you are a Christian. But not doing these things, having no interest in them, feeling no conviction about them, it is a sign that you are not a Christian. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Where there is a true love of Jesus Christ, there will be a true desire 
to obey him. And where there is no desire to obey, there is no true love. Think about a physical body. A physical body that's alive, it will resist corruption. But when there is no life in that physical body, there will be no resistance to corruption. And so it is spiritually. Where there is spiritual life, there will be a resistance to the corruption of sin. But where there is no resistance, there is no life. Again, this text is a call to self-examination. Am I walking as a child of God? And if not, then we must ask, am I a true child of God? May each one of us take seriously this call to self-examination. Next, this text is a call to repentance. None of us can look at this text, honestly, plumb the depths of what Christ says here, and then say, all of this I have done perfectly. Each one of us should be challenged and convicted from this text and be moved to repentance and a renewed desire to walk in obedience to God's commands. And finally, this text indicates the degree of suffering that Christians should be willing to endure for the sake of Jesus Christ. If you remember, when we looked at the blessed statements found in verses 20 through 23, and we saw that the first line application from those statements were to those who suffered for the Son of Man's sake, for the Son of Man's sake, for Jesus' sake. And this is not a new sermon. Jesus is continuing the same sermon. He's still talking to the same group of people, and the context has not changed. And the suffering, the self-denial that's described in our text should be willingly and even gladly taken up by every believer for the Son of Man's sake. Now, if we're honest, as we read some of these instructions that Jesus gives, in our flesh, we may recoil from them. They're not comfortable, some of the things that Jesus says here. But we bear this burden out of obedience to Jesus Christ and for His name's sake. And we rejoice in the privilege of being able to do that. Well, now let's begin to look at the text itself. The first section of this passage, verses 28 through 31, I'm going to call the golden rule applied. Before we look at the specific examples or applications Jesus gives here, let's look at that golden rule as it is known and as it is stated there in verse 31. As you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Do to others what you want them to do to you. It seems like a, a ubiquitous moral statement. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything unique and distinctly Christian about this statement. This seems like a statement that any rational, philosophically minded man could develop. The Jews had very similar statements. For example, Maimonides, the great rabbi of the 12th century, he wrote, All things whatsoever you would that others should do to you, do the same to your brethren in the law and in the commandments. On the surface, a statement that sounds very similar to what Jesus said. Aristotle, when he was asked how we should behave toward our friends, he replied, as we would wish that they behave toward us. And so many people look at this statement, and they say, ah, Jesus, he was a great teacher, a great philosopher, a great religious thinker, like Aristotle, like Maimonides. But is that all that Jesus was? And is that all that this statement from Jesus is expressing? Is the golden rule, as it comes from the lips of Christ, really the ubiquitous moral statement that it appears to be at first glance? Let's examine it more closely. First, Jesus' statement is unqualified. Jesus did not say, act this way toward your friends, as Aristotle said. Nor did he say, act this way toward your brethren, your fellow Jews, as Maimonides said. The only word Jesus used to describe who we must act this way toward is men, as you would that men should do to you. It's that word anthropos. It refers to man or mankind generally. It's used over 550 times in the New Testament to refer to mankind. According to the words of Christ, this is how we should act toward all mankind. And second, Jesus' statement is rooted in justice that's separated from the identity of the person we are acting toward. There's an idea that's gaining popularity in our time that suggests we should adjust justice based on the identity of the people involved. That's not a biblical idea. That's not true justice. We're to treat everyone as we want them to treat us. Now, we tend to be very good at discerning justice when it applies to us. Even children, 
have a very strong, innate sense of justice as it applies to them. How many times have you heard a child say, that's not fair? Right? They know. We have a, a strong sense of justice. And sometimes we're correct. And what we really do want is justice. But many times we're biased. And what we want is mercy or favorable treatment for ourselves. But we're to take that same judgment that we're so quick to apply to our own circumstances, apply it to everyone. Don't be concerned about justice only for you and yours, but have that same level of concern for everyone. Put yourself in their position. Ask yourself, if I were in their position, how would I want to be treated? And then actually act that way. John Calvin wisely observed, where our own advantage is concerned, there is not one of us who cannot explain minutely and ingeniously what ought to be done. But since every man shows himself to be a skillful teacher of justice for his own advantage, how comes it that the same knowledge does not readily occur to him when the profit or loss of another is at stake? But because we wish to be wise for ourselves only, and no man cares about his neighbor. God is concerned with justice, with mercy compassion. And heaven forbid that we should shut our eyes to the justice that God demands and demonstrates in His Word. Heaven forbid that we should turn even from that natural revelation of justice that God has put in our hearts, the revelation of right and wrong that God has put in the human heart. We discern it for ourselves. We are without excuse if we do not discern it for others, all others, and then act accordingly. And so, we have seen that the statement from Jesus is unqualified, it's rooted in justice, and finally, it requires, again, it requires that we lay down our lives. I believe this is the point of greatest separation between the statements of Jesus and the statements from mere human philosophers. Jesus' statement makes it a moral imperative that we lay down our lives. I'm not referring to physical death, although that may be required in extreme cases, if we're to be faithful to this command from our Lord. But every single day, if we follow this command from Christ, we will be required to lay down our lives. There's that story of the husband who was sitting there in his living room reading the Bible, and he's overcome with these feelings. And so he says to his wife, he says, I love you so much, I would die for you. And the wife, who's over in the kitchen, she says, I don't want you to die, but I would like help with the dishes. Now, it's easy to talk about dying, but to actually live it out requires that you lay down your life, your desires, your wants, to deny yourself, and like that husband, to help with the dishes. Now, it's kind of a silly example, but it illustrates what this text requires. If we will obey Jesus at this point, then we must daily die to ourselves, our wants, our desires, our feelings must be laid aside. We lay down our lives before our victorious Savior, and we say, Lord, my life is yours. Use it as you will. Help me, Lord, to obey. And we know that this extreme of self-denial is called for because of the examples that Jesus gave in the preceding verses. Let's look at those examples now, beginning in verse 27. I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies. Oof. Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He did not cushion the blow. It's a strong statement. And if we're honest, it makes our flesh recoil. Jesus used that strongest word for love, agapeo, that self-denying love, that love that's drawn out from us, not by the object of the affection, but by the very nature of the one who is loving. In the truest sense, this is only possible if we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We must be transformed by the grace of God, be new creatures in Christ, to love as we are commanded to love in this verse, to love in the same way that God loved us. He loved us when we were not worth loving. And the word for enemy is very strong as well. It means hated or hateful. Have you ever hated someone? I say hated in the past tense because I hope and pray that there's no one here today who profess to be a Christian who's harboring hatred in their heart toward anyone. It's a sin against God, and it will destroy you. And if you've ever harbored hatred in your heart, bitterness in your heart, then you know it's self-destructive. To lay that burden down at the cross of Jesus Christ and bear it no longer. 
It's a burden that's too heavy to bear. Repent. Turn from your hatred. In obedience to this command of Jesus Christ, turn from hatred to love. Love your enemies. But again, if you've ever hated someone, you know how hard that can be to choose to love them. Our capacity as sinful humans to harbor ill will toward other people, it defies reason. But Jesus turns around and requires us to love other people beyond reason. Beyond human reason. They are your natural enemy. They may hate you. You may have every reasonable cause in the eyes of the world to hate them. But Jesus says, love your enemies. Before we move on, I just want to point out that Scripture removes any excuse for lovelessness. Scripture commands a man to love his wife, to love other Christians, to love his neighbors, and even here, to love his enemies. And it's the same word, agapeo, that's used in all these commands. Where you find find yourself unloving, you find yourself in disobedience to God, in sin. Verse 27 continues, Do good to them which hate you. Now is there a true distinction here? Or is it tied in with the first part of the verse? It certainly expounds upon and applies what Jesus has just said, love your enemies and then do good to them which hate you. But I separated it because of this word hate. This word hate. It's meseo in the Greek. It indicates an active hatred. Now sometimes we can keep our enemies at a distance. We can keep them at arm's length. You know, they can hate us from a distance. We can love them from a distance. Right? And that's a little bit easier sometimes to deal with. But when it's up close and personal, and we're daily aware of their active hatred toward us, it can be much harder to love them. But our responsibility is unchanged. As they exercise hatred toward us, an act of hatred, we must do good toward them, an act of good. Like Stephen in Acts 7, as the stones were hurled upon him, we must pray, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And notice that this is an active show of love that's commanded here. We're not to love in word only, but in deed. We're to do good to them which hate us. We're to show by positive acts, whenever there is an opportunity, that we harbor no malice, that we do not seek revenge, that it is our desire to love our enemies and to do good toward them. This is the kind of love that Christ commands from us. This is the golden rule applied, the golden rule as Jesus gives it. Next, at the beginning of verse 28, we read, Bless them that curse you. Bless them that curse you. This word bless is where we get the English word for eulogy. It indicates speaking well of a person or speaking well to a person. We should always endeavor to speak as well of another person as we possibly can. Such an instruction from the lips of Christ forbids us from gossip, from slander, from verbal attacks, from cursing, from any other use of our tongue as a weapon for the destruction of others. The tongue has great power within it for destruction, and we must be on guard against it. Remember the warnings that we receive in James about the tongue. James 3, 2 says, If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. James 3, 6, The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. James 3, 8, The tongue can no man tame, and is an an unruly evil full of deadly poison. We must submit the use of our tongue to the authority of Jesus Christ and use it for blessing. We're to bless our family, our friends, our neighbors, our acquaintances. We might not always succeed in this, but we would all recognize that, yes, ideally we would bless these people. We would speak well of them. We'd speak well to them. But in our text, Jesus does not say Bless your family, bless your friends, your neighbors, your acquaintances. Jesus said, bless them that curse you, that curse you. Have you ever been cursed? How'd that make you feel? 
Yeah, I'm a very non-confrontational person. I don't like conflict. Uh, only on very, very rare occasions have I been cursed at. Because usually I, I walk away from a situation long before it gets to the point where someone curses at me. But on those rare occasions when I have been cursed, I've just been filled with this overwhelming desire to bless that person. Right? <laughs> no? Has that not been your experience? Maybe, maybe it has. And if that's the case, then you're, you're far more spiritual than, than myself. But when someone curses me in my flesh, I have all kinds of reactions. I may want to curse back at them. I may want to uh, speak ill of them to, to someone else. I may think mean thoughts about them. I may even desire to do violence toward them. There's all sorts of possible reactions in my sinful flesh. But if you are in Jesus Christ, if you've been made a new creature in Christ by the grace of God, your heart of stone has been replaced with a heart of flesh, then you must resist the inclination of our flesh and obey the command of Jesus Christ and bless those that curse you. It's not easy. This is the way we're called to respond as Christians. It's the way of obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ. And if that was all that it was, it would be enough. Infinitely enough reason. We do this out of obedience to our Lord. But not only is it the way of obedience, it's also the way of freedom. It's the way of freedom. We do not have to be bound in our response by those who curse us, or those who do evil toward us, or those who hate us. We can rise above by the grace of God and love and do good, and bless those who act against us. It's the way of freedom. Now Jesus continued there in verse 28, and he said, Pray for them which despitefully use you. To despitefully use means to abuse, to mistreat, to falsely accuse. Now when those, when you are abused as a Christian, those who abuse, mistreat, falsely accuse, Despitefully use a Christian, what is the Christian's recourse? And Jesus here, he says, prayer. You are to pray for them. Now, I want to qualify what I just said there, because I don't want anyone to leave with the idea that the Bible teaches that the Christian who is being despitefully used, abused, mistreated in any context, has no biblical resource but to pray for that person. That is not the case. God has ordained authority structures in society to protect people. God has ordained the family, and the authority structure that God has given in the family is there to protect members of the family. This is laid out for us beautifully in Ephesians 5 and 6. The children submit to the parents. The parents love, instruct, and discipline the children. The wife submits to the husband. The husband loves the wife. And in this authority structure that God has ordained, there is protection provided to those who are within. God has ordained the church, and the authority structure of the church when it functions as it should, serves to protect the members of the church. The church is vested by God with spiritual authority, authority to instruct, to correct, to discipline. And this provides another layer of protection for those people who are under that authority structure which God has ordained. And God has ordained human government. Human governments have authority given to them from God. They wield the power of the sword. And they are to use that power, biblically speaking, they're to use that power to punish evildoers. And so once again, this provides another layer of protection. The family unit should protect members of the family from abuse. The church should protect members of the church from abuse. And the government should protect its citizens from abuse. And all these institutions, they have different areas of authority. And in different circumstances, it would be our right and even our responsibility to appeal to these different God-ordained institutions for protection. The Bible does not teach that Christians must suffer being despitefully used, abused, mistreated, and that we have no recourse but prayer. No, the Bible gives very clearly defined authority structures to which we can appeal to for protection. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And he has ordained means to right wrongs here on earth. Ultimately, he will right every wrong in eternity. But here on earth, he has ordained means to right wrongs. And it's proper and right for us to avail ourselves of those means which God has provided for our protection. But now look again at this verse. Look again at this verse. Jesus, what does Jesus say that we personally are to do if we are being despitefully used? Pray. Pray for them 
which despitefully use you. And again, this does not forbid the use of means that God's provided for protection, but immediately, personally, I as an individual am required to pray for that person. To pray for that person. When we were looking at verse 27, we used Stephen as an example of someone who did good to them who hated him, and we could use him again as an example here as he prayed for those who despitefully used him, even to the point of killing him. Now, why did Jesus instruct us to pray? What does prayer accomplish? Prayer won't change your enemy. Your prayer, you're not going to change your enemy. You're not going to fix your circumstance. So why pray? Well, of course, the obvious answer here is obedience. Obedience. God has commanded that we pray. God has ordained the ends. He's also ordained the means, and he has commanded us to pray. If we do not pray, then we're actively disobeying the commands of God. And the biblical word to describe that is sin. We pray as an act of obedience, as an act of worship, as an act of submission to God. And that would be reason enough. Again, infinitely enough. But prayer accomplishes something else as well. Prayer changes us. Prayer will bring our will into submission to God's will. Prayer brings us into an attitude, into a mindset of worship. And as we pray for those who despitefully use us, it will be easier easier for us to resist the inclinations of the flesh to avenge ourselves and submit to the command of God to love our enemies. Verse 29 begins and says, Unto him that smiteth thee on the cheek, offer also the other. Now before we begin to decipher the meaning of this instruction, let's discuss some things that we know this cannot mean. We know that the Bible does not prohibit the use of physical force. God has, again, given the state, the sword, as part of their God-ordained authority. And they use that sword for the punishment of evildoers. In the law of God that he gave to Israel, he made provision for force to be used, even by private individuals in the defense of themselves. And so this statement from Jesus is not a wholesale call to pacifism. It's not a complete prohibition from the use of physical force. This verse speaks to our response when we personally suffer insult. If we suffer insult against our person, even a physical assault as described here, like someone striking us, we're to turn the other cheek. We're not to avenge ourselves. We're not to take it upon ourselves to exact retribution. We're to appeal to the authority that God has ordained. And to tie this in with what we studied in verse 22 of this chapter, if we suffer assault for righteousness' sake, for Jesus' sake, then we're to bear it patiently and even to rejoice in that suffering, and be glad that we're counted worthy to suffer for His name's sake. Now, after this instruction on how to handle affronts to our person, Jesus instructed us on how we are to handle affronts to our property. The second part of verse 29 through verse 30, we read, Him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Now some of this may sound strange to us, but it would have been more clear immediately to the Jewish audience who first heard this instruction. This instruction to not forbid someone to take your coat has to do with Jewish civil law. Now if you were a Jew and someone insulted you in the street, you could take them to court and to civil court, sue them, and exact a substantial fine from them, uh, the equivalent of about $1,300 in today's money. Now, one of the specific examples that's given in the Jewish law of this sort of public insult is someone taking away an outer garment, like a coat or a cloak. It's one of the specific examples that's given. And so the Jews who first heard this instruction from Jesus would have thought previously that if someone takes my coat or cloak away by force, that they could sue that person and recover a substantial amount in damages. It would have been their right to do that. But Jesus told them, not only should you be willing to suffer such an insult, but you should be willing to suffer it twice and lose your coat and your cloak rather than give place to a vengeful attitude. 
And then Jesus gave these instructions about money. Give to every man that asketh of thee. Now Jesus is referring here to charitable giving, giving to meet the most basic needs of human life. And the Jews had a strong tradition of almsgiving. If you read the law, the, the Lord set out wonderful outlines how to protect and care for the poor in Israel. And the Jews, although they had strayed much from the law that God had given, they had a very strong tradition of almsgiving. But they were reluctant to give to people who were outside the Jewish nation. Now Jesus' instruction told them that this should not be the case. They should be willing to meet the basic human needs of every person who is unable to provide for himself, Jew and Gentile alike, and it applies to us. We should be willing to give to meet these most basic needs to all men. And further, Jesus said, And if him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Now, Jesus is not talking about robbery here, where someone has taken your money or goods by force. Again, the Christian has legitimate recourse from crimes like this through the government which God has ordained, through the authority structure which God has set up. God has given human governments the power and responsibility to punish evildoers like robbers and thieves. The Christian can and should go to the government for help when a victim of a crime like that. But what Jesus is referring to here is a situation where you have borrowed someone goods or money, and then that person, because of some sort of calamity that has come upon them, is now unable to repay you. Now again, under the Jewish law at that time, the creditor could take the debtor to court and have him thrown into prison until he had the money to pay. The creditor could get a lien against the debtor's property and sell that property until he had recovered the debt. But Jesus says no. If this happens to you, if you've made this sort of agreement and your brother, your friend, your debtor is not able to pay you back, it's better to suffer loss than to do harm to this person. And this is no new instruction. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 15, this is what God laid out in the law that he gave to the Israelites. And they were no longer following that, but Jesus is just reminding them about what God had already said. And this brings us back to verse 31. Jesus gave all of these examples in this sermon, and then he laid out this overarching principle that's to guide the lives of his disciples. As you would, that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. This command from Jesus is unqualified. You're to treat your family, your friends, your neighbors, and even your enemies this way. This command from Jesus is rooted in justice and not in identity. And finally, this command from Jesus requires that we lay down our lives. In all of these things, Jesus is our supreme example. No man has ever loved his enemies like Jesus loved his enemies. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Our sin made us Christ's enemies, yet he loved us with an everlasting love. No man has ever done more good to those who hated him than Jesus. While on this earth he was cursed, reviled, rejected, killed, and for those who hated him, Jesus died. He willingly laid down his life for our good while we hated him. Jesus blessed those who cursed him. He prayed for those who despitefully used him. When he was insulted and beaten, he did not avenge himself, but submitted to these insults against his person, even to the point of death, in obedience to the Father's will. He was stripped of his clothing. But he did not just give his clothing away, but the covering of his righteousness, that we would not stand naked before the judgment of God. All the world was his by right of creation, but he did not insist upon his own rights. Rather, he humbled himself and entered his creation as a servant to accomplish the work of redemption. What beautiful revelation we see here of Jesus Christ, of his love, of his humility, of his work as the Redeemer. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, read the verses we have gone over this morning and realize that everything that Jesus said, he did for you. You were his enemy, but he loves you. You actively hate him as you go on in sin, but he does good toward you. You curse him, but he blesses you. 
You despitefully use His common grace, but He prays for you. Turn to Jesus Christ in repentance today. Today is the day of His mercy. God will not always suffer sinners. He is long-suffering, but He is not eternally long-suffering. When Jesus came the first time, He came as a suffering servant. But when He returns, He's coming as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the judge of all the earth, who will rule with a rod of iron. And you must know Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin, or you will face Him as your judge in sin. And for the Christian, we see that Jesus does not call us to anything in this passage that He did not do Himself. He has led by His example. And now we are under command to live in obedience to this passage because this is God's character. God is kind and long-suffering and un- to the unthankful and to the evil. God is merciful. God is loving. Scripture calls us the children of God. Are we living like the children of God? Let's close in prayer. Lord, there's great depths to this passage. And Lord, as we consider each one of these statements and we see the depth that's behind it, Lord, so much of this we recoil from. It's so hard. How can we do this? Only by your grace can we obey. Lord, help us to be convicted from this passage. Lord, help us to be humble before you and say, Lord, I see that I've come short here. Help me as I go forward to walk in obedience to what you've laid out here in your word. Lord, we pray that in this we would see the ministry of Jesus Christ as one who perfectly fulfilled all of these. We thank you for that, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.